Good morning, church. This is Pastor Nate Jackson. Listen, I want to welcome all of you in the sound of my voice, um, whether you are local, meaning Pendleton and Umatilla County uh, here in Oregon, or, uh, or, or not. We've had uh, the privilege of ministering to people all over the world uh, as a result of having to go digital uh, from time to time throughout the last three or four months. So I am excited that we are reaching you wherever you are at. Amen. Uh, I pray today's message will be a blessing to you. Uh, I want to just share my heart a little bit before we start. I don't want to drag this on too long today, but I want to share my heart with you. Uh, as I promised I would in this quick clip we put out a couple days ago. Um, I just want to share with you some bullet points, right? The elders did get together. We are doing this digitally right now for this season of the summer, um, specifically because we met together after having prayed separately and then we prayed together. Uh, we sought the Lord through every measure we knew how. Uh, we put all the information we had together um, at the same time, again, not trying to reason through what God wanted or trying to reason out what God might say, but trying to be very, very clear that we were dealing in the best wisdom possible. Here's what we know for sure. We don't know anything. <laughs> and the, the fact of the matter is, best we can tell, uh, it is, if we're being honest, not opinionated, but honest, uh, we don't know anything about this virus. We don't know anything about the current status. All we know for absolutely sure is that we don't know anything at all for sure. Uh, and friend, whether you want to believe this or not, and I mean, I don't mean to start this, this time together offensively, but I would tell you regardless of your temper or your temperament or your education or your uh, support system around you for your beliefs and faith and thoughts and, and opinions on the virus and what it's done to our country or our world, I would tell you officially on behalf of everybody that has any, any clear view of this, uh, we don't know, right? We really don't know. Uh, and you don't know. Quite, quite frankly, right? You can say, no, 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 Pastor, you might not know, but I absolutely know. I watch this channel. I am tied into the CDC. I am tied into the hospitals. I am tied into to the, the social system of our country. I'm tied into President Trump. Uh, you, No matter what your sources are right now, all sources that we have any knowledge of, and that's five deep in all different directions, I would tell you that we don't know, right? We surely don't know. So as much as we're certain, 100% sure, we know when we get together and talk really honestly before God and before one another, we know we don't know, right? So based on that, we're doing our best to try to keep one another safe, um, not in fear, but in respect of our testimony. Because again, and that's gonna have everything to do, that's gonna have everything to do with our message today, amen? Is our testimony. What is our testimony? What, what matters most, right, in this, in this season of our lives and in our season of our lives as faith family and believers? <clears throat> and I would tell you that today's text is going to cover a lot of that. And I just want to dive in really quick and share some thoughts with you this morning. One, I want to tell you that when Cheryl and I had little kids, when our, our five were different ages, but when they were smaller, almost without exception, they would each, as they were little, would grow into this place where they were communicating with us. And, and oftentimes they would be watching something on TV or they would come away from a friend's house or they would... Uh, spend time with someone else who had something else or or someone else that would have fixed something or their mom was about to fix something or teasing with the idea that what would you like it if I made this and it was pretty amazing that even though when they were young not so much when they were older but when they were younger uh, depending on their mood that day depending on what someone had said depending on what the what the TV show their favorite cartoon commercial might have said the minute they hear that whether it's a toy or a particular food dish or a particular snack from the store um, when you ask them, hey, what, would you like that? Would you like one of those? Would you, what, do you, do you, are, you, do, are you a big fan of that? And they would quickly, just without any hesitation, let us know that they were not only fans, they loved it, right? They loved it, whatever it was. If it was a toy, they'd seen it on TV, they loved it. If it was a, a food dish, uh, even if they had never eaten it before, they had seen other people talk about it, they'd seen the commercial on TV, they love it. And then as you begin to drill down a little bit and question them like, okay, so, so you are, you do know that you, if I asked you, we want to go to the store and get that toy, or I want to, we're going to fix this for dinner or right. These things or to get that bike. You're sure that's what you want. You're sure that's what you love. And they would say without hesitation, absolutely. That's what they loved. And then as you begin to drill down a little deeper, you find out that they a had never seen one with their eyes. They, if it was food, they'd never actually tasted one. And if it was a toy, they'd never actually held one in their hand. But because of influences in their life from wherever, they were absolutely certain and sure that this is what they love. Now, here's the problem with that. And I'm not trying to be political now. This has nothing to do with the virus or, or what's going on in our world per se. But I would tell you that there's an interesting correlation there between that and the body of Christ, that and the kingdom of Christ, if you will. I would tell you that if you ask the average church person, um, are, you on, are you on team Jesus? Are you a Christian? 
Do you belong to him? We would probably, almost unanimously, if we're regular churchgoers, we would probably say, yes, we are. I would tell you the next series of, of questions, if you drilled down a little further and you said, so, so you are a committed Christian, you are a, a, a faithful follower of Jesus, you are on team Jesus, you're part of the kingdom of God, you're anxious for the kingdom of heaven to be unfolded so that you could enter into this eternity with the Lord, you are on his side, you belong to him, he belongs to you. And most churchgoers in our country, for sure, maybe the world would say, yes, yes I am, yes I am. If you drilled down even tighter, like with my kids, and you said, so what is it that you know about the kingdom of God? What is it you know about Team Jesus? What is it that you know about what's involved for you, right? What, what is your real experience with that relationship with Christ? What do you know from the, from the supported in the word? What do you know about Team Jesus? What do you know about living a Christian life? What do you know about following Jesus at all costs? What do you know about being part of his kingdom here and there? What do you know? The vast majority of people, sadly, even in the church, like my kids when they were little, might not have any real answers. They might have to admit, after much questioning, that they really didn't have any idea. They had proof texted a commercial. They had listened to the sure sound of a friend who told them this was the best toy to have, or a schoolmate that told them you have to have this particular bike, or this particular lock, or this particular pencil, or this particular binder or backpack. They didn't themselves know what it really was or, or how good it was. And I would tell you in the body of Christ, too often, that is our scenario, right? We, I'm not trying to talk us out of being saved today. I'm trying to help us understand that too often in the body of Christ, in the kingdom of God, if you will, that we're claiming to be a part of, too often we don't get enough Bible, we don't get enough of what God actually says. We proof text a little bit. We take what we want, we take what someone's shared with us, we take bits and pieces here and there. And if we've been in church at all for any period of time, surely they've preached a few positive messages. And as a result, we've decided this is what it looks like to be on Team Jesus. This is what it looks like to, to be on his side, to, to be in his kingdom, right? He's my king, we love that. We don't like kingship or authority necessarily in our country, but we surely like the idea of making it to heaven. So. So we've pieced together our own idea, much like one of those toys or a bicycle that my kids would, would tell me they love that, Dad, I have to have that. I love that, that's my favorite, that, I'm a part of that. I, that's my favorite food, that's my favorite toy, I have to have that. And, and I, just, I just know my life will be complete because I, I have to have it. When I get that, my life will be complete. I would tell you that this is one of those cases where in the kingdom of God, the Bible talks an awful lot about it, <laughs> an awful lot. And I would tell you, when it really comes down to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of Christ, all synonymous, right, all together, I would tell you that we don't know a lot about it, unfortunately, and not a lot of it's preached, not a lot of it's taught in our current 2020 year. Um, a lot of other distractions right now. And I'm just gonna try today, because it is has to do with our context today, I believe, even though the term kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven in our text today isn't particularly spelled out, but I would tell you that Jesus is in the process, in context, in the last two or three chapters that we've covered together, I would tell you that in context, he has begun to lay out what the kingdom of God is. And I'm gonna give you some pretexts to some several quick scriptures that would illustrate what the priority was for the kingdom of God, for the kingdom of heaven, for the kingdom that Christ was to be king when he's writing, or when this is being written about him in context. He is the king, right? He was sent to be king and he is the king. And I would tell you that the scriptures way back before Jesus was ever, ever here, the scriptures began to talk about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. The prophets of old, hearing from the Holy Spirit of God, began to, to speak about these things that they knew very little, if anything, about, but it would speak to the king that was coming. It would speak to the kingdom of God that was, that was awesome. So we're going to kind of walk through some of that quickly. First of all, in the Old Testament, just real fast, 1 Chronicles 29, 11, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty, everything in the heavens and on earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom, he says, writer of Chronicles. We adore you as the one who is over all things. That's way back when, when First Chronicles was penned, right, was, was etched. Let's go into the New Testament, just because I don't have a lot of time today about this, but I want you to, I want to build this, this urgency about the kingdom before we get to our text today, because I think it absolutely is Jesus answering some of those questions for real for us, what is it to be on Team Jesus? What is it to be part of the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven? What is it to really be a part of that? What's involved in that? What's that look like? And again, we've had two or three chapters already in John that have really begun to spell that out. We finished just recently in the first few verses of chapter 15 last week when we were together or online. 
where we talks about and Jesus is giving another analogy, but it's so clear. He says, my father's the, the gardener and I am the vine and, and you are the branches if you're mine. And if you're mine, then the spirit of God, the nourishment, the, 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 the flow of water, the flow of, of life will come through me, through the branches and you will bear fruit. You'll bear much fruit if you're in me. He's describing the kingdom of God. He's describing the kingdom of, of which he is, is king, amen? And this is, we're in context, we're gonna flow through. So Luke 4, 43, it says this, he says, I must preach. This is Jesus himself, again, sharing the priority and the mission of his kingdom. He says, I must preach. This is Luke 4, early in Luke. I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God. The good news of the kingdom of God. And other towns too, because this is why I was sent. Now I want you to note in that one verse, it's interesting that in our culture, we spend a lot, if we, if we preach the Bible at all, we talk a lot about the gospel, the good news, amen? The gospel which we do here, we preach and teach the gospel. That's what we teach. Jesus is saying, when they're saying, no, stay with us, this one group, he says, stay with us. He says, no, I've got to go. And I must preach the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns too, because this is why I was sent. So I would tell you early on, Jesus and Luke's account, Jesus is making clear that this whole kingdom of God thing is pretty serious, right? It is right alongside of seeking to save the lost, right? And coming for the lost sheep, this is why he was sent. Uh, Matthew 10, 7, Jesus is sending out the 12 now. In Matthew 10, right? He's sending out the 12 and he says, go and announce to them, everybody you come in contact with, go announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near, right? It's on us, it's here, right? It's present now because he's here, amen? Acts 1, 3, post-resurrection. Jesus says during the, the, Luke writes Acts, he says, during the 40 days after he suffered and died, speaking of Jesus, he appeared to the apostles from time to time and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive and he talked to them, here it is, about the kingdom of God. After the crucifixion of Christ, after the resurrection, after the, just between the resurrection of Jesus Christ back to life fully, fully restored, between that and the ascension into heaven going back home, we know historically and biblically it was about 40 days. And Luke, the writer of Acts says, he showed up many times with the apostles and he proved that he was very much alive over and over and over. And he talked to them. What did he talk to his disciples, his followers about? He talked to them about the kingdom of God. Amen, the kingdom of God. There's a lots more, but we'll just hurry through. Acts 8, 12, it says Philip now, Philip is preaching in Samaria. Again, in the, amidst a lot of persecution already in the early church. Same message, he says, but now the people believed Philip's message of good news concerning the kingdom of God, listen, and the name of Jesus Christ. Christ not being his last name, Christ being the anointed king, right, the anointed one. And as a result, many men and women were baptized. Acts 19, eight says, then Paul, now we're talking about Paul, not Philip. Paul went to the synagogue and preached boldly for the next three months, arguing persuasively, as probably only Paul could, about the you got it, the kingdom of God. Acts 28, 30, Paul now in Rome, right? Toward the end of Acts. He says, for the next two years, Paul lived in Rome. Not a, a, an, an easy place to minister, right? Lived in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited him, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. And no one tried to stop him there at that point, right? Matthew 13, another case, it says, Jesus teaches about the value and the priority of the kingdom of God. He says, this is Jesus now, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. And in his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy that field. And again, he says, if you don't, in case you didn't miss, in case that got sideways, again, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. And when he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and bought it. He sold everything he owned to buy that one pearl. That's Jesus' description for them to help them understand what is the kingdom of heaven worth? What is the kingdom of God worth? What is, what is the value that Jesus has been teaching them so much about, right? Matthew 5.10, the segue into our text today, says God blesses those, part of the Beatitudes, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right for the kingdom of heaven, he says, is theirs. And lastly, just before we dive into our primary text today, 1 Timothy 6.15, well into the New Testament period, first century. And it says, for at just the right time, Christ will be revealed from heaven by the blessed and the only almighty God, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. Friend, I would tell you that the Bible, this is, I'm just cherry picking a few. I'm telling you, it's just packed through the Old Testament and just packed through the New Testament. And I would challenge you to remember the last time somebody preached to you or taught you about the kingdom of God. 
I would tell you that we talk about it, we reference it when we preach a lot of times, but for whatever reason, because we're not a, and there's not a monarchy, there's not a, a, a king in our country per se. We have a different form of republic. We have a different form of government for as long as it stands. And I would tell you that, listen, we don't understand that, that thing. We think about England, we think about other countries when we think about kings and the authority that their kingly family has. And I would tell you it's frustrating a little bit because when we read this, man, clearly the word of God from the front to the back spoke of Old Testament toward the New Testament, was prophesying, predicting, making clear that it was all about the kingdom of heaven. It was all about the kingdom of God. And there would just be one lifted as king, right? And then we get to Jesus and Jesus begins to, he starts his ministry by saying, I've got to go, I've got to preach the kingdom of God. And he does that faithfully. And then he disciples 12 and he teaches them to go and he sends them out. And he said, they're saying, all right, so what do we do when we go? And he says, heal the sick, share the good news. And here it is, share and teach the kingdom of God. And then the, all of the New Testament models we have, all of them, we see it woven in every one of them. And what are they sharing? They're not just sharing the four spiritual laws, friend. They're sharing the kingdom of God. And in particular, post-resurrection, they're sharing the Jesus Christ, the anointed one, the anointed King of kings and Lord of lords is the king of this kingdom. Amen? He's the king. So what is it to be his? What is it to be what is it to belong to him? What is it to be part of his kingdom? Because really, accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior, listen, that, that is what you're doing, right? This is almost like, I feel like I'm sharing the fine print of a contract, right? Many of us, if I asked and I said, hey, did you say yes to the Lord's offer to you? God sent his son for you. Did you say yes? So many of us in our culture say yes. No, we call on his name. We pray. Absolutely. I said yes to the offer. And then you begin to prod a little bit. You're like, that's great. So what is that to you? What does that mean to you? What, how did it change your life? And too often we hear the same thing. Well, I just, you know, I mean, I kind of watch better with my language and I, I show up for church more often than I used to. And right. And I would suggest to you that the kingdom of God that's been prophesied for thousands of years and then fulfilled in the coming of the king of that kingdom. And then the king sends out his people and then literally sends out people who would tell it by testimony and share him with them and them and them. And now us. And that message never changed. It was never about, hey, can you knock on the door and hand somebody a Bible? Those are all good things. But it was always about inviting them to make him the king and master and Lord and savior of their life. To say yes to Jesus is not just to get out of hell free. It's to say, I trust you. I know your word is true. It is about the kingdom of God. You are my king. Amen. You are my king. I submit and yield my life to be a part of your kingdom, to be a part of you. Right? So with that, with all of that said, I know that's a lot of preview, I guess, or precursor to the text. But we're going to dive into our text. We're in John 15, beginning in verse 12. Uh, we're going to read a few verses and kind of walk through this. And hopefully what I just shared with you, even though it was just a quick, just a quick flyby, right? Um, I hope it's enough to help you understand that we don't talk enough about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom that Christ is king of. And we've somehow made the gospel something different. And all the New Testament authors made it clear that their sharing the gospel with the world that needed it was to share the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, the anointed king of that kingdom, right? So it all involved this authority. It all involved him as king. It all involved his sacrifice, his, this incredible good news that the king was sent to lay his life down for his kingdom, right? And that's, that's where we're at. So John 15, verse 12, here we go. He says, this is my commandment, love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love, he says, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command, right? If you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends, Jesus says, since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me, he says, I chose you, amen. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit in context, right? From John 15, the early part. I've, I've appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask, whatever you ask for using my name, right? Using the King's name. This is my command. Again, he says, love each other. So this first little section here, I would tell you, and we're going to try to stay with this and make some good time through this, but it's, is that the kingdom, listen, is about love and the relationship with the King. Right? It's about love and having this deep rooted friend based close relationship with Jesus Christ. Right? And that's, that's the kingdom. 
That's why, again, I would say that I think when, when any version of that in 2020 that says, yes, I'm in, yes, I'm a Christian, yes, I'm a faithful part of his, he's my king, yes, I can't wait for him to return because I'm ready to go home. Any part of that testimony that doesn't look like or begin to look like or begin to look like he's at work in us where we yield to his authority, his kingship in our life, I would tell you it's, there's something wrong, right? There's something wrong. Here, here's, here's what I would, I would unpack this with, right? As our king, and he, in context, remember we just came out of John 15, 1 through 11. In context, he's talking about, again, as I said earlier, my father's the, the gardener. I am the vine. I'm the vine. There's not many. There's one. It's me. And you're the branches if you're in me. And if you're in me, he says, and I in you, then you will bear much fruit. And as you do, you will bring glory to the father. And I would tell you, in context, he never stops. So he's not changed gears. We just had to separate for the sake of time in two weeks, right? He's still on that. And he says he's appointed you and I. He's appointed you and I to go out, right? To, to go away from our normal lives, to go away from our normal scenarios. Doesn't mean you can't do it in your present context, but to literally be intentional about going out and producing lasting fruit, right? Lasting fruit. And he says, listen, if you're doing that, if you're in him and he's in you and you're producing lasting fruit, then yeah, you can, you can ask because you know why, unlike my kids when they were little asking for a toy they really didn't know anything about, if you're in Christ and he's in you and his life sources through you and you're getting to know him and he's knowing you and he's pouring through you, all of a sudden your wants change, your affections change, your direction changes. Asking in his name, listen, is asking in alignment with your king. I hope that's really making sense because I know this is butchered by so many people in our culture today, right? I've heard this preached so many ways, I can't even tell you, most of which were heresy, right? It's like, man, if you're really a Christian, all you've got to do is ask. And if you ask specifically with those magic words in Jesus' name, you better believe you're going to get it. And if you don't get it, it's going to be because you don't have enough faith. And I would tell you that's heresy, right? But what the Bible does clearly say in context is that in this relationship, in this loving relationship, you're not even gonna ask. I would tell you, you're not even gonna ask for something that's outside of the will of your king, right? Not knowingly, you follow? And then of course, it's the Father's good will to pour out whatever you're asking because you're asking in alignment with his will, which is in alignment with the king he set aside and sent to pay the price for you and I. And now he sits at the Father's right hand. That's what the Bible says. Right? Book of Acts makes it clear. He's reigning. Listen, some people are still waiting for him to come reign. He's reigning right now, according to the Bible. Amen? So this is powerful. This is all about the kingdom. Is, so here's a good answer, right? What is it, if you're asked, what is it to be on Team Jesus? What is it to be part of his kingdom? What is it to be with him as your king? What does that look like? What does that begin to look like if we allow him to have his way, his authority in our lives? And I would tell you, we produce fruit, lasting fruit. We begin to love one another like he loved us. And I know right now, listen, this, this is very touchy because we're, man, we want, even in the body of Christ, this is such a heartbreaking thing to me and I'm just gonna share it from my heart right now. I can't even imagine how anybody in the body of Christ mirroring this, right, in context, in our scriptures today. If he's in us and we're in him, like he says in, like he says in the first 11 verses of chapter 15, if he's in us and we're in him, I can't imagine an acceptable loss of another brother or sister in Christ over an opinion having to do with anything other than the kingdom, right? You want to teach heresy? I'm going to tell you, I have a hard time sitting down with you because then, then we need to talk, right? We need to get this clear. We need to line up with the scriptures, amen? Not my opinion, your opinion. We need to clear this up. Right now, across our country, across our state, in our church, there are men and women who have such strong differing opinions and they're coming to various elders, including me, letting me know that this is right, this is clear, and my way is the only way and you need to straighten this out. And listen, anybody that doesn't abide by this way, then, then they just have to leave. And I get this impression, it's like, oh well. And I need you to hear me, that's not the heart of God. It's just not the heart of God. And I need you to hear from the deepest part of my heart and hear from the scriptures. He said, if you're with me and I'm in you and you're in me, you're going to bear much fruit. And in context, he comes right in and says, here's the new commandment. Love one another, not just the way you think you might ought to love one another, but love one another like I've loved you. Let's, man, with that, just, just an overf overflight, right? Just a flyby, right? Let's just talk about that for a second. Well, how did he love you? How did he love me? How has he loved us? We're supposed to love one another like he loved us. You suppose it's fair to say that he loved me while I was still a wretched sinner? You suppose it's fair to say that he loved you while you were still a mess, even after you claimed to be his. 
You suppose it was, it's fair to say that he loved us and was patient with us and put up with us even when we didn't agree with what was clearly written in his word. He clearly spoke it, but we hadn't gotten to that part yet, so we're still out there acting like we're still part of the world. You suppose it's fair to say that he loved us even then? And I think the answer to all those is yes, he did. I know he did in my case, and I believe very much he did in yours. So I would ask you, how did he love you? And I would tell you it was with a self-sacrificing lay your life down for you and me. And my question is, is that what he looks like in my life right now in 2020? Mid-virus, right? Mid-rioting, mid-looting. Is that what it looks like? Does that, what, is that, does the love that I have for one, for my brothers, my sisters, is that what it looks like? Amen? Is that what it looks like? Because he said, that's the command, and he says it twice in this little short stretch of, of scripture. That's the command. That's what it looks like. You want to know what it is to be on team Jesus? You get out of his way and you let his spirit pour through you and begin to bear lasting, producing fruit. And part of that fruit, listen, begins to look very much like our king. And we begin to love one another like he loved us. And then he talks about, I don't want to get too deep in this, but he, he talks about this. He talks about the fact that, that, listen, there's a relationship involved. We're not just slaves anymore. We're not just uh, even bond servants. We're not just under some obligation legally. Listen, it's like Paul said, man, it's, it's the love of Christ that draws me and compels me and constrains me and controls me. It's the love of Christ. It's no, the more I know about him, the more I know what he did for me, the more willing and gladly obedient I am. Listen, you want to see a streak of rebellion in me? It's because I am no longer gladly obeying the Spirit of God in me. I have begun at least for a second to push him aside because I need to get this point across. I need to hurt my brother or my sister. I need to be right. I need to make this stick. You need to get this, and if you don't, oh well. And I would tell you that is not the heart of Christ. That is not the Spirit of God in us. I don't care who says different. The Bible's clear, amen? Love one another like he loved us. Hmm, let's pick it up right there, verse 18. Verse 18, here we go. If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. That's what he says. The world would love you, he says, as one of its own if you belong to it. But you are no longer part of the world. And don't, don't miss these next words. I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than the master. Since they persecuted me naturally, if we were in a room full of people right now, I'd say, everybody say naturally. I mean, that's, that's important. Naturally, since they persecuted me, Jesus said, naturally they will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. They will do all this to you because of me, Jesus says. For they have rejected the one who sent me. They would not be guilty if I had not come and spoken to them. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Anyone who hates me also hates my father, Jesus says. And if I hadn't done such, such miraculous signs among them that no one else could do, they would not be guilty. But as it is, they have seen everything I did. Yet they still hate me and my father. This fulfills what is written in their scriptures. They hated me without cause. They hated me without cause. I would tell you if we're following along in the same line of thinking is that the kingdom produces, produces love and it triggers hatred. I say again, it produces love and it triggers hatred, right? And, and I guess if I could add anything to that, it would be clearly in text and context because of our king, right? What is the kingdom life? What does it look like to follow Jesus? What does it look like to trust Jesus for your Lord, as your Lord and Savior and King? Here it is. It produces love for one another like he loved us, right? Do we ever match that? Do we ever get there perfectly? Probably not, but I'm telling you, as we continue to yield to the Holy Spirit in our lives, this begins to happen, friend. And if it doesn't, you need to check your heart because that's scripture, amen? This is the command. You're with him, you obey this, you love one another, you love, you begin to learn to love, you seek to love in your heart and in your mind, seek to love other people, your brothers and sisters like you've been loved by Jesus. That's part of the DNA of the kingdom of God, right? That's part of the DNA of our king. And then he goes a step further and he says, and here's the deal, you need to understand, you will be persecuted, amen? You will, for my sake. Listen, not for the battles we just go out and create, for my sake, for his sake. Because they hated him, they'll hate us. And because they hated him, they persecuted him. And he says, it's a natural thing. 
It is a natural thing. Peter goes on later and he says, man, don't, don't look at this like it's some strange thing happening that you're suffering for the cause of Christ, that you're suffering, suffering for your faith. Now, right now, listen, you know where I'm about to go, amen? Right now, we've got people on both sides, maybe three or four sides, I should say, not both, right? Three or four sides. And the crazy part about that is they're all polar opposite of each other in each direction, and everybody's absolutely sure they're completely right themselves. Now, here's what I know. Here's what I know. And we're going to, before we're done today, it's going to make this point really clear. If it's about me, if it's about my wisdom, if it's about my brilliance, if it's about my opinion, if it's about what, I, what I'm absolutely sure I know because of the sources I get it from, if it's about me and that becomes the line that's drawn between me and a brother and sister or between me and someone else, my testimony, listen, becomes about me. My testimony becomes about my brilliance. My testimony becomes not about my love for one another or my patience with one another or my long suffering for my brothers or sisters because that's what's been shown to me by Jesus. It becomes, listen, the opposite of that. It becomes that I'm right and you're wrong and if you don't agree, oh well. And I would tell you and I would remind you again that Jesus on the cross, on the cross for you and I, looks out at those who are murdering him and his response is not, well, at least I know where you stand. We'll see how you end up in judgment. His response to his father was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. And I ask you again, how much did Jesus love you and I? How much did your king, if you're on team Jesus, if you're in the kingdom, how much did your king love you? How patient was he with you? Amen? How patient? Listen, I would tell you that he is clearing this up, and I'm just going to spell this out as quick as I can, right? This kingdom dynamic, what is it? I would tell you it's being loved relentlessly by God, right? That's first. Loved by Him. Our part of this kingdom, listen, is just the natural response to that is to love Him back. Listen, and if you don't, again, your heart is not where it should be, right? So the kingdom, the kingdom dynamic is that we are incredibly loved and we love Him back. And then because of this dynamic, because of the work He's doing in us, listen, we love one another in the faith. We love one another. And then it doesn't stop there. We know from other scriptures that Jesus taught. He said, then love your enemies, and we know this because that's what he did for you and I. We were his enemies. And he loved us relentlessly. He chose us while we were still enemies. Listen, man, please hear me. That's the dynamic of the kingdom, amen? If you're in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of Christ, this is the dynamic. This is what it is. This is the fine print, amen? The flip side of that he's covered in this text. He says, not only are you loved by him and we love him back and, and then we love one another and then we just break all the rules just like Jesus did and we love our enemies. In addition, listen, we learn because of what he's doing in us, we learn to hate the sin that got us here. We hate the sin. We resist sin in his power and his strength. Listen, we're hated by haters and then we reach to and forgive the haters. And I know, listen, right now, most of you, this makes for a great Sunday school lesson, doesn't it? About right now, you lean back in your chair and you start making a paper airplane when you're a kid, right? Because there's absolutely nothing about I just said that makes sense in the natural. Nothing. None. We love the idea that he loved us relentlessly, but deep down, we kind of all think we're, we were a pretty good catch. Amen? The Bible says the polar opposite of that, no matter who you are. Amen? So we're not a good catch. He loves us anyway. But we talk about that, and, and we talk about that in church, and then we get an amen for that because he has this amazing love for us. And then, then we, we resist sin, and we don't talk a lot about that, but it's like, well, yeah, I guess those handful of people that take this really seriously, they're really part of the kingdom of Jesus, they're really on team Jesus. All of a sudden, over the years, you just see them begin to resist the very sins that got them there, and, they, and we see that. And then all of a sudden, sure enough, man, as they begin to stand in love and in grace and in mercy, they begin to stand. You can't get that light around the darkness without offending, and then those people will hate you just like they hated Jesus. Hear me, friend. They didn't hate Jesus because he was so opinionated. They hated Jesus because he brought loving light and forgiveness. And they weren't prepared to admit their sin, much less ask for forgiveness. It was not that he was so opinionated and so pushy. And so he did not beat these people up with the Bible. Amen. He, he reached to them in love over and over and over and over. In fact, if I had to be really honest, coming back through the Gospels, I would tell you his biggest problem was church people. And I love you. You know I do. I, I pray you love me. But I'm telling you for a fact. Church people, we need to hear this. Because there's a lot of church people that don't love one another like he said to love one another. There's a lot of us, listen, that, man, we've shored up against our enemies so hard. There's no love in our hearts for our enemies. And Jesus is saying, listen, it's not even about you, friend. 
If they're giving you a hard time, if you've lost that job because of me, if you've, if you've lost that spouse because of me, if you've lost the, the opportunities because of me, if you were persecuted because of me, if you get outside of the United States, listen, you, you've lost your wife because of me, you lost your daughter or your husband or your wife, or you, you lost the, the church you had, they burned it to the ground. Listen, whatever it is you lost, you were persecuted and it wasn't even personal about you, it was me. It was our king. It was our king. Because he loved that much, all the evil of Satan, listen, has warred against him from the beginning. And I would tell you, when we get the greatest attacks for our faith, rest assured, their hatred is not for us directly. Their hatred is for Jesus. And Jesus said when they hated him, they also hated his father. Amen? I hope, I hope, that's, hope that's making sense. This is war. Amen? This is. But I caution you because I think right now there's a lot of talk about war. There's a lot of talk about drawing lines. There's a lot of talk about sides. And I would tell you that the war we're in is a spiritual war. It's not a physical war in, in our context. Amen? It's a spiritual war. And the Bible makes that crystal clear. We don't fight against people. We're not supposed to. We do, but we're not supposed to. It's a spiritual war. But the war is on. Amen? The war is on. And I would tell you, he chose you and he has called you. And he's called you out of the very world that we blend so well with. First Peter goes like this, First Peter 2. He says, but you are not like that, talking about the world you just came from. For you are chosen people, you are royal priests, a holy nation, he says. God's very own possession. You get the kingship here? His very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. Not how brilliant we are or how smart we are. The goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Verse 10 says, once you had no identity as a people. Hallelujah. Now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. It's a relationship thing, friend. It's a family relationship. I mean, I wish I, wish I could stand on something bigger. I wish I could get on the top of this church and, and film from the top of the roof. If it would cause one of us, even one of us, to go, man, you know, maybe I've got it wrong. Maybe I've got it wrong. Maybe I've got it wrong. Maybe it isn't about me. Maybe it is about my king. Maybe it isn't about me and how right and how demanding I am. Maybe it is about Jesus. Maybe it's always been about Jesus. And if it's about Jesus, before you draw your sword like Peter and defend him, listen to me. He healed the guy that Peter took the ear off of. It was that frustration that Peter felt that night that so many of us in the body of Christ right now are suffering with. We don't understand because we want to fight. And I would tell you the fight is on, but it's not that fight. Listen, the fight is to love one another. The fight is to love your enemies. The fight is to deal with the persecution head on in the power and the grace of Christ that was shown to us. You know, when we shine the most, it's not when we scream the loudest, friend. When we shine the most is when we, they expect a response of anger. They, respect, they, they expect a response of, of, of vile and venom. They expect it. When we give it, it clearly identifies us with them and our blender makes, makes us look just exactly like them. It's not until we reach to them in love and grace, even with the truth that offends. It's not until then that we begin to look like our Savior, like our King. Amen? Jesus said if, if he had not come, if he had not come, they might, have, they might have had an excuse, but he did come. Amen? Had he not have died, had he not have shown them the miracles, had he not have done everything that the Old Testament said, when I send the King, when I send the Messiah, this is what he's going to look like. Had he not have brought every one of those, clicked every box, had he not have done that, they might have had an excuse, but they didn't because he did. Amen? He says at the end of that little piece of text, he says they, he fulfills, they fulfill prophecy when it says they hated him without cause. He's referencing Psalm 69, and it says, those who hated me without cause outnumbered the hairs on my head. <laughs> and I would tell you that is Jesus to a T, amen? When he stood on that cross, when he was hung on that cross, he stood by himself. I, I would ask you to, to, to consider something. What if being part of the kingdom of Christ, what if, what if really following King Jesus looked more like, instead of begging for God to bless our thing, right? Our position, our opinion, our want to fight this battle and that battle and this distraction and that distraction. What if, what if really following Jesus and really yielding to his spirit in us, what if, what if that wasn't about us begging God to bless our thing? And it was really maybe for some of us, maybe the first time in a long time, we ask him to, to bless our lives by helping us become solely focused on his thing. Solely focused on his thing. 
right? Right now, listen, I, I would, I'm not, I'm, my head's not in the sand, amen? I know we live in a world that's just upside down. I know that. It's not the first time, by the way. <laughs> it's not. World history would scream this. It's not the first time. In fact, as we're saying, oh my gosh, the sky is falling. Other countries are people who are losing their loved ones because of Jesus, solely because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And it happened yesterday and the day before and the day before and the day before. We've just lived on soil that didn't have that. We've lived on spoiled soil, amen, for sure. And it's to the, to the glory of God. It's been his grace, for sure, up to this point. Listen, our country's biggest lack, our country's biggest lack is not, is not tolerance, right? There's a lot of people right now, it's like, man, that's the biggest issue. We just have such, such a level of intolerance on every side. Our issue is that we don't, is that not that we don't tolerate enough. Our biggest issue, based on the word of God, is that we don't have enough repentance. If there's a lack in our country, it's that we've forgotten how to repent. We've forgotten how to turn. We've forgotten, we've forgotten the king that called us out of darkness. We've forgotten. And I would challenge you. I would challenge you to let the idea of his kingdom and him being king, and it not being about us, it being about him, I would challenge you to begin to open up the scriptures, not with our agenda, not with our side, not with our opinion. I would challenge you to open up the scriptures as if our king laid his life down for us when we didn't deserve it. What does it look like to make sure the world sees that king in me? What does it look like, friend, for the world to see that he alone is our king? What does that really look like? And I would represent to you that the scriptures aren't even a little bit vague. We've just ignored those. Amen. We've just ignored those. We've written those off like, well, we're just human. I, my, I question that, friend. Do you, do you think Jesus didn't know we were human? Do you think our king didn't know we were human? When he said that this is my command to you, is to love one another like I've loved you. You suppose he just, just shot so high that he knew none of us would make it, we just write it off? So I would tell you that I believe he knew we were human. And I believe he knew that, again, if we're in him, he's in us. If he's the vine and we're the branch and we're really in him, not resistant to him, we're going to bear much fruit. And that fruit's going to look like the vine. Amen? It's going to look like the vine. I would just tell you, man, he's, he makes it clear. He's called us out of this, right? This is who we used to be. He's called us out of it. You say, preacher, that's old school. That's old school revival stuff. That's, that's brush harbor stuff, pastor. I, I appreciate all that, but this is 2020, and you've got to be relative in 2020. I would tell you that the fact that we need to repent has never been greater right now in 2020. I don't know that it's ever been greater. It is as relevant as it can possibly be. Even, listen, judgment needs to begin in the house of God. Amen? I want so bad to point a finger at the world right now. But I'm reading this and I'm not hearing that. I'm hearing the world's going to hate us. And I look around at most people in church, most people that, that go by his name, most people that claim to be on Team Jesus. He's my king. I can't wait to see him. Most of us, listen, are not hated by the world because we look just like him. We look like them, we act like them, we talk like them, our heart is like them, we're bitter like them, we're angry like them, we're fighting like them, we're arguing over stuff that doesn't even matter in the kingdom. It's dividing us left and right, and the world doesn't look at us with that resentment like, man, how are they? How have they got it and I don't? That's what they saw Jesus as, friend. Jesus was the light, Jesus was the truth, Jesus brought love and grace and forgiveness and mercy, and they hated him for it. They hated him for it. Do the, does the world hate us? Here's a better question. Does the world even know? Does the world even know he's our king? Let's, let's wrap this up. Verse 26 goes like this. He says, but I will send. This is so beautiful. Don't miss this. He says, I will send, but, he says in context, but I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the father and you and will testify all about me, he says. And you must also testify about me because you've been with me from the beginning of my ministry. The kingdom, what is the kingdom? What is he saying? He's saying that the kingdom is about truth and testimony. The kingdom of Christ is about truth and testimony. I would represent to you in context, right? Not trying to pull these apart, in context. I would represent to you that Jesus did know we're human. I would represent to you that Jesus knew how flawed we really were. I would represent to you that in scripture, it makes it crystal clear that he knows we're broken when, when we come to him. But I would also tell you in context, he's saying, here's what the kingdom looks like. If I'm in you, verse 11 verses of chapter 15, if I'm in you and you're in me, 
I'm going to pour my life through you, and it's going to change you, and you're going to bear fruit. That's going to bring glory to my Father. And then he goes in and he goes, so here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is, branch, here it is. You want to know what it looks like to be in me? You want to know what, what the fruit begins to look like? You begin to love other people like I've loved you. That's what it says. You know what he knows about us, friend? Without the Spirit of God in us, that's impossible. I say again, without his Spirit in us, that's impossible. But he's going to answer that by giving us his Spirit. That's what he says. Amen? I know in the natural, having an enemy that hates us, with or without cause, mostly without, according to the Bible, if it's really about our faith, I would tell you that it's impossible for us to love our enemy that's shoring up against us without cause. It's impossible for us to love our enemy when he's shoring up against us with cause. Amen? But it's not with the Holy Spirit. It's not with the life flow from the vine to the branch to the fruit. Because it's not our life. It's his. Amen? It's not our ability or our discipline. It's his life flowing through us. All in context. Chapter 15. It's all right there. Amen? It's all there. You say, well, what are you saying, preacher? So you said first we need to do it. Now you're saying we can't do it. And I'm saying you sure can't. But you absolutely can with the Spirit of God in you if you will yield to your King. Amen? If we will stop asking to be King, if we will stop coming to the Scriptures with our ideas, if we'll stop coming with our, our notion of opinions and doctrines and trying to find Scriptures that will somehow support that, you don't do that with the King. You don't come into the presence of the King and tell Him what you're going to do. You come into the presence of the King grateful that He spared you and that he's adopted you and made you part of his kingdom. You come in before the king humbly, saying, teach me, show me. Show me what it is. Pour this life of yours through me, that the world that's hurting, just like I was, will see you too in me, right? That's what you do before the king, if he's your king, right? The Bible makes it really clear. The Bible makes it so clear that this same Holy Spirit, see, right now, some of us, right now in the sound of my voice, some of you have already tuned me out, right? You're, you're scrolling through your phone right now. You're, you're looking for other stuff because I've talked about things, honestly, that I know are trouble for me, and I'm sure they're trouble for you. How do you really love one another that way? Now, if they agree with me on my points, then absolutely they're with me, right? But if they don't, they're not with me, right? What if Jesus would have done that with you and me? Can I tell you, I, I'll be honest, I wouldn't have made Team Jesus. And friend, whether you realize it or not, you wouldn't have either. Love one another like he loved us. Recognize that you've been called out of the darkness into the light, chosen by Jesus to go and bear lasting fruit to the glory of God. And in the process, listen, you will have people hate you. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ is a relationship of love that will draw hatred from the world because they don't know the love of Christ like we do. And then he says, you can't do it, but there's good news. I'm giving you my spirit. And, and the Bible, listen, in context, the Bible makes it really clear. The spirit of God, if you're really on King Jesus, if you're, if you're really with the king, if, he's, if you're really part of the kingdom of God, listen, the Bible says the spirit he's put inside you and I is the exact same spirit that was on Jesus' life that raised him from the tomb. I say again, the same spirit. That's what the Bible says. Amen? The same spirit. So before you tell me, I, I appreciate that preacher, and yeah, if you just want to do some miraculous work, but I'll never love my enemies. I'll always, I'm always ready to gun them down. I'm always ready to prepare. I'm all, listen, that's Peter. Pre-crucifixion, pre-resurrection, pre-ascension, pre-Holy Spirit, that's Peter. Peter was angry. He was frustrated. Quick to take a life. Quick. And we would say, way to go, Peter. That's exactly what I would do. Somebody comes to Jesus, I'm gunning them down. But what did Jesus model for you and I, friend? What did he model? He heals the ear of the soldier that Peter took the ear off of. And you better believe we don't have a lot of diagram there, but the next scene we see with Peter, he's denying Christ altogether. Peter was so out of sorts. He was so frustrated. He was so humiliated. He was so angry. He was so, listen, opinionated. So opinionated. But his opinion was wrong, friend. 
You said, no, 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 man, the New Testament church was, was started because of Peter's first message, Holy Spirit anointed and filled. The answer is yes. And Jesus, when he came back to the life, listen, when he came back to life, he called, told the angel, Lord, tell him, listen, I want all, I want to meet all my, my, my apostles in, in town, and especially Peter, right? He calls him out, and Peter. Why? Because Peter would have already known that whatever he thought he knew was completely wrong. And yet Jesus still loved him, and Jesus still forgave him, and Jesus still called him by name. Amen. And yes, it was his first message that launched the New Testament church that we're all a part of. Amen? I would tell you there's great hope for this, but I need you to hear me. His love, his love for others, his love for enemies, same spirit that was in him is in us. We can't do it, but God can, right? And he will. Listen, and as we do, it becomes the mark on our life. It becomes the testimony. The last thing he says here in this text is that the Holy Spirit of God will tell you everything and testify about me. That's what he says. And the next sentence is, because he is, we testify about him. So we live in a world where we want to make this about a whole lot of other things, especially about us. And I would tell you the scriptures are pretty clear. He's loved us overwhelmingly, indescribably, but it's always been about our king. It's always been about our king. Some of you are like, no, 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 but I, I'm hurting right now. I, this is about me. No, it's about him. Amen. His love is for you, but it's about him. And the Holy Spirit, listen, other people say, man, the Spirit got all over me and I did this and I became the show. And I'm like, I reference this text, right? Because the Holy Spirit, all powerful, the Holy Spirit of God testifies of Jesus. Jesus is the subject. Amen. Jesus is the hero. The Holy Spirit makes much of Jesus in us. And as, as such, listen, it's a natural byproduct to begin to share with that same power. That's why we can love one another, because of what he's doing in us. That's why we can even love our enemies and know that it's not about our enemy, not the physical enemy. It's about the spiritual enemy. Is that, is that beginning to make sense? I pray it is right now, because this is what he's talking about. He's saying that it's all about king. It's all about the king. It's all about Jesus and this incredible gift of his spirit in us that makes much of Jesus. And as he does, listen, the natural next step is that we make much of Jesus. He testifies of Jesus. We have the testimony of Jesus and we share the testimony of Jesus. Amen. I don't, I don't want to be hateful, not even in the slightest way. I want to say this in love. You tell me that the Holy Spirit has spoken to you and it somehow has, he has somehow led you to draw swords against your physical enemies. And I'm gonna tell you, based on the word of God, you need to check your heart. You need to check what you're listening to, amen? You tell me that the Holy Spirit of God is in you and for you and leading you, and it's somehow leading you to be completely distracted and make it all about anything else other than Jesus. Make it about the virus, make it about rioting, make it about race, make it about anything else. And I've heard this, child of God. I've heard this in the last month. I've heard preachers, preachers, people that get in the pulpit every week say that if Jesus was here today, he would lead the, the looting and the rioting. That's heresy, friend. That's heresy. You tell me that the Spirit of God led you to riot, and I'm telling you, you've got the wrong book you're looking at. The Spirit of God testifies of Jesus. Jesus said, love one another like I loved you. And yeah, because of that, I've, I've chosen you. I've pulled you out of that darkness. And I've brought you into my light. And I chose you to bear much fruit. I chose you to bear lasting fruit for me, for my Father. And yeah, because, because as you get out of the way and you yield to my kingship in your life, my authority in your life, my spirit in your life, yeah, you're going to make enemies. Not because you beat them over the head with the Bible, but because they can't be in the light. It exposes them. The Holy Spirit will always do his job, friend, but do not attribute the Holy Spirit with drawing huge divisive lines between you and another brother or sister. Do not attribute the Holy Spirit to the rioting and racism. Do not attribute the Holy Spirit to these things that are dividing our nation right now. They are not of God. I pray when this is done, I'll still have a job, and I pray you still love me, but I need you to hear me. I struggle with this. And I'm just confessing that before God and before you, I struggle with this. But you know what I'm committed to today? And I pray that's what you're committed to today. 
We've heard the word of God. You know what's in me? I've got the Holy Spirit of God in me. I hope he's in you. I hope we're hearing that today. And instead of you hating Pastor Nate, or you're hating what I'm saying, I pray to God right now that just like me, I am broken. I need to repent. I need to repent. I need to turn from my way fresh to his. I need to learn to love like he loved me. I need to learn to love my enemies like he loved me, even while I was still his enemy. I need to stop putting my ideas and my notions of what I'm supposed to do and the opinions I'm supposed to have. I need to stop bringing them to the scripture and I need to begin to open up the scripture and let it change my opinions. I love you, church. I do. Nobody has failed God bigger than me that I know of. And yet I stand before you to tell you the Holy Spirit is just ripping at my heart right now. Not just for you, for me. So I'm, I'm praying for us. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for what you're doing in my heart. Thank you for what you're doing. I say it in faith in the hearts of people listening right now. There's not an acceptable loss in our church. There's not an acceptable loss in the body of Christ. There's not an acceptable loss of a brother or sister anywhere in the sound of my voice. And yet I preach this today knowing that I'll probably lose some. I'll probably lose fellowship with some even today. Even with decisions that we're making as leadership for this church that we've sought you so hard for, even in those decisions, we will no doubt, if, if you don't intervene in their heart and they don't give way, I will lose people that I love dearly. I just pray that you go before us. I pray that you go before this message. I pray, Lord, that it would fall on ears and a heart that are humble and open-handed and open-hearted for you and your word this morning. I pray that today. I pray you unite this body. I pray you unite us as your people that we would learn to be known in this town and in every town as those who love like you loved us. And while we will surely have enemies, Lord, may we learn like you did to love even our enemies. May our testimony, may our testimony, our every breath, may it cry out to this dark world that we know the light and the light is in us. It is Jesus, our Lord and our King. Oh, we praise you today. We praise you out loud. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for the privilege of, of what we're doing even right now digitally. God, I pray you will save people even right now from the darkness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love you, church. Thank you for, for being with us this morning.